Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Good afternoon. With me today are two people, Lisa Marie Churko. You heard from her earlier this year. She is the producer of the Dementia Caregiver Cruises. And Richard Crichton, he is also caring for his wife, Kate. And today we're talking about caregiver grief and maybe kind of how to navigate all of the intense feelings that caregivers have while we're while we're caregivers so thanks for joining me Richard and Lisa thank you Jennifer it's great to be here I'm also happy to be with you Jennifer look forward to it so Richard why don't you tell me or tell us a little bit about your journey because you also took care of parents so you've been down this road several times, and now you're on a journey with your wife, which I understand from our previous conversations is different than caring for parents. Yes, I, I would say so. This is, uh, by the way, my 30th consecutive year of caregiving. And uh, so wow. I have been through a lot. On the other hand, uh, my experience with my wife is very different because I am her sole caregiver and I'm living with her. I, it's a full-time job. I've retired to, to take care of her uh, with our four parents and then with my dad's significant other uh, after my mother had died. Uh, you know, it was a different kind of uh, experience. My parents lived in town, so there was a lot of day in, day out activity. Uh, with Sarah's parents, they were in Texas to start with, then her father died. Later, her mother had vascular dementia and joined us, was with us in our home for five and a half years with uh, round-the-clock care 24-7 that five and a half years. So our, our place ran like a sort of like a little hospital or a nursing uh, facility. And uh, my dad had a stroke. Uh, he lived to be 100. He was the longest living of uh, parents and uh, had a stroke three, years, three and a half years before he died. And that immobilized him. And uh, he was in nursing, skilled nursing for the rest of his life. But mentally, he was sharp. He was actually in the early stages of vascular dementia, which is a little funny to say for someone who's 100. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was still rather sharp and uh, whatnot. So overlapping with my father's uh, situation was the diagnosis with Kate in 2011. and. Um, so I've had that kind of experience. And uh, that one is very different because I think, I hate to generalize, I can only tell you about our experience, but the difference is in the nature of the relationship. The, the spousal relationship is just clearly a different from a, a parent-child relationship. Uh, in many respects, I guess I, I felt like my parents had lived full lives and so their being ill and dying was part of what I expected all along. But I didn't feel that way at all when Kate was diagnosed because I felt like we were reaching a point in our lives when we would be doing much more. Uh, and fortunately we have. Perhaps I'll just stop a moment and see if that just lays the groundwork for, for a discussion. Wow, thank you for sharing your- That's exactly what you're talking about. It, my grief, feelings of grief and sadness don't usually appear in that kind of situation. They come up in the middle of the night. Okay. When I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and my thoughts keep going to the future mm. and what might happen. And even though I feel like I have a game plan, I, I, I feel a sense of, um, anxiety okay. uh, about it. Um, so that, that's the, probably the most typical thing. On the other hand, what happens during the daytime would be perhaps when we're not, when we're not interacting at all, but that um, I just feel like there are things that I should be doing that I'm not doing, and I have no excuse for not doing them. <laughs> I just don't feel like doing it at that particular time. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, those are the kinds of situations that occur. When I am with Kate, I feel like that I am 
constantly working on focusing on her. And that actually keeps me occupied. I don't feel grief at that moment. I do, uh, I'll tell you the toughest moment though, and you're, this is a sadness moment. I'm not sure you would say this is part of grieving, but it's certainly a sadness. The troublesome part for me is when she's hurting. And that has happened a few times. She's had a couple of panic attacks and several time, times that I would call more anxiety rather than panic attacks. When she doesn't know who she is, she doesn't know who I am, she doesn't know where she is, and she's just uneasy. Those are tough for me to deal with. Mm-hmm. And, but again, what I have to do is help her. And I'm so focused on trying to, for example, give her some kind of stimulation that will you know, show her pictures, talk about family, things mm-hmm. that I know she likes, to give her some sense of comfort that I think that sustains me for a while during the moment. And then it's afterwards that uh, there may be some kind of lingering thing. I keep, I find that keeping busy, and I do stay pretty busy, Mm -hmm. I think staying busy has helped me tremendously. Okay. I may also add, there's a real difference with my father, and I think something that helped me, my father, uh, I have great admiration for him, but he was a very gregarious person. So he had a distribution list of a lot of people he kept up with on email when he had his stroke at 97. Uh And he could no longer use his computer afterwards. So I took over the distribution list and I sent out almost daily emails to everybody on his, they had about 55 people. Uh I sent emails out almost every day under his name and under it I said, and scribe. And I tried to capture what he was thinking and feeling all the while. Uh, And I often read them to him and he felt they were, I was capturing it. That gave me a sense of purpose and kept me from, from feeling sadness, even as he deteriorated. Uh And then of course he really did leave a good life until two weeks before he died. So that was fortunate. Let me stop there. Wow. Well, I love that story. And thank you for sharing that with us. That's beautiful. So just sort of taking the reins over from something that he did before the stroke and and being a part of that. And he's still communicating with his friends and he knew you were doing it and he was happy about it. And and it helped you and it helped him. Oh, absolutely. He got a kick out of it. And and there were people and I was sharing a lot of these things on Facebook as well. And my father was a funny man. uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, there was always a story to tell. And, uh, it, you know, for example, I'd, I'd get a call in the middle of the night, it's two o'clock in the morning, and he'd say, hello, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I, I was sleeping, Dad. He said, oh, what, what time is it? Well, it's two o'clock in the morning. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and he would always go on like this, even, even near death's door when I introduced him to a preacher who was going to do his funeral service uh-huh. he said well, how much you have to pay him and <laughs> i i just always had story i always had material uh-huh. always material he was a fun guy people uh-huh. loved him and uh that that helped sustain me quite honestly sure. and i am sustained now with kate mm-hmm. by it's more like a, a mission a feeling for her i want her to feel safe and secure and happy and so i i concentrate on that now that's what some people would say is denial um i don't know i i call it love i call it love i wouldn't call it denial maybe a a psychiatrist or a psychologist would but i i i call it love and um your father sounds like a very special man and so does kate Wow, those are thank you for sharing. The, these are great stories, and I think they 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 help people too. So, for instance, when I when I talk about my journey, and I urge others, I you know if I had to do it over again, what I wouldn't do is go into that tunnel. So what I did is I had this tunnel vision. I didn't. I just took my pain and my my grief and just put it on a shelf, and I and and I concentrated at the task at hand was to make sure that my dad got the best care as possible 
um, at the nursing home and um, everything that, you know, there was quite a bit involved there. But what you're talking about um, is very important. So there's little ways. And Jennifer, I think you'll agree that care partners and caregivers could maybe pivot and shift during the day. And, and I think just sharing your story about your dad's newsletter that may have given uh, caregivers some ideas, you know. Um, now, Jennifer, when you go in to see your mom at memory care, she's got a lot going on there. Um, I, and I know there's some days you, you've shared with me where there's some anxiety and, and you've helped her to, can you share with us maybe some ways that, that you pivot to out of that sadness, anger, anxiety? Well, I don't know if it's, if it's a positive thing for some, but it works for me is because she's declined quite dramatically over the past four months and we've had some uh, miscommunication between her brain and her bladder. So she thinks that she's had an accident when she hasn't. And that's been not fun. There have been many days I've shown up and she's in a state of distress and undress, which is really hard to say clearly. And in the beginning, I it, it would hit me kind of like almost like a slap across the face because she's, upset and unhappy and it's like oh i just you know i just wanted to take her to the park to watch the kids or whatever so now i just i kind of before i get out of the car I center center myself a little bit and i just expect the worst and every week when i've expected just stress and unhappiness i haven't gotten any of it so <laughs> i don't know if it's i don't know exactly why my world works that way but i try to just when I show up, I try to make sure that I'm in a positive mood. I put a big smile on my face, no matter how I feel, and you know, greet her with almost a ridiculously effusive, happy greeting. I mean, it probably looks a little bit clownish to people who don't have broken brains, but it always kind of puts her on the right on the right step. It's like, oh. My best friend is here. We're going to go do something fun. I'm not sure that she remembers that, but it's more of a, a feeling because I work very hard to give her happy little adventures, take her out of the, you know, memory care residence, give her fun things to do, even though they're not really all that fun. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have, I struggle a little bit with, I get very, I have to kind of tamp down the, I get kind of angry because I feel like even though, you know, my dad had chronic illnesses and we all should have expected him to go first. That was never a conversation. And I get, I get mad because like the woman's got plenty of money. She could travel and decorate and do whatever the heck she wants and not be stressing about whether or not she's had an accident or repeating herself the same spot at the same place in the park over and over and over. It just, I, I guess I get angry because I feel like she's just been robbed of what she should have. She's got three grandkids. That's, you know, my daughter's almost 28. My niece is almost 14 and my nephew's 10 and a half. So she's got, you know, she's got a variety of grandkid ages to be doing, you know, fun things. You know, my daughter's planning a wedding and we don't even know if we'll bring my mom because she gets confused and it's stressful. And then you feel guilty because you're like, well, she should be there. But having her there, it doesn't really add to the joy. It actually makes things worse. So it's, it, I always feel like this tug of war. Like, what's the right thing to do for myself or, you know, the extended family versus what's the right thing to do for mom? I constantly feel that, that tug of war, like, emotionally not easy they're not easy things that you're talking about and um and i know they they are common across the board with families you know and there's all these stages of this disease um they're not easy uh, one thing i i stress with my clients is talking about besides living in the present moment is that no matter you know we we know the progression of the different types of dementia. We know what happens and what the body does, but 
the person never stops being who they are. There's just sort of think about there's a there's a little layer. Yes, there is some it is a brain disease, but but their soul, their essence is still there. It's always still there. And um and, and it's easy when we're frustrated during the day and and there's multiple up maybe there's additional health issues and your loved one is having a bad day. It's easy to forget about that, but it's the disease can talk all at once, but underneath your loved one um, does not fade away, you know, and we hear these terms thrown out all the time, you know, it robs it. Yes, it, it, it does do horrible things to the human body, but it cannot take away um, their spirit and their essence. And, um, you know, and that's, that's hard to remember. I know when, when we have our day to day issues, um, it sounds like Richard that you do an excellent job with remembering um, who Kate is all the time. Well, I let me say I, I attribute a lot of that directly to Kate herself. Uh, in fact, I, I love your saying something about retaining uh, her essence because that's exactly what has I've experienced with Kate. She is still underneath the same kind, loving person who also wants to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. um, I, for example, even now, there, there are times when she will snap at me in a way that she would never have done before. Um, mm -hmm. But the immediately having done so, she's likely then to apologize to me. And she's, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, sh I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. Uh, she's so sensitive to that and she's she expresses her appreciation just effusively and and uh, so commonly in in everyday life uh she talks about uh, how patient i am with her all the things i do for her. i mean she's she is still so aware of, of so many things and her own self-awareness i'm i'm astounded at, at her own self-awareness uh, so I have an easier job than most caregivers, uh -huh. uh, and I'm I I really even hesitate sometimes to to talk about what our experience is like because I know other people are struggling more who have more challenging situations than I have by a long shot, um, and uh, there are many things working in our favor, and the only thing that hasn't is the fact that she has Alzheimer's, and you can't get around that. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, her essence is still there. Well, that's why. Oops, sorry, Lisa. I well, have, no, I, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. My mom's essence is still there, but because she is my mom, I get the parental essence. I think I said on the phone, and I said this to Richard earlier before we were recording a couple weeks ago when I was visiting with her, and as you know, because we're still having beautiful weather here in Northern California. I take her to the park because she enjoys watching children. That's probably getting boring for everybody to hear, but that's what we do. And she verbalized some stuff at me. It was words, but it was not a sentence. So I apologized and I told her I didn't, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear all of that. And she repeated it and I, it still made no sense. And I probably should have just agreed with her, but it was a frustrating day in the beginning of the day for me not having anything to do with my mother and I wasn't wasn't as mentally sharp in that direction as I guess I should have been and so I apologized again I said I didn't understand or something along those lines and she just whipped her head around and looked at me and she goes now I've told you twice now you just sit still and be quiet and I was like oh I do not think we are going down this path and I just looked at her and I said, I'm sorry, but people do not tell me what to do. I'm an adult. And then she says, well, excuse me for living. I'm like, okay, this is going well today. <laughs> so I get a lot of the, it's like my entire life, whatever I did was not enough. And as an adult, my daughter's 28 and the path that we all thought she would be on is not the path she's on. So I've had to mentally pivot and say, you know what? I did a great job. She's happy. She's on her own. She's supporting herself. Yes, she's not using her college degree, but 
that's because she's got a, a chronic illness that prevents it. So life is fine. With my parents, I think they always wanted, they wanted the best for me. And if they didn't think that I was meeting that mark, I always felt like no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. And I still feel like that with my mother. I don't know if that's all on me or if I'm getting some of that parental vibe from her, from her essence, like you said. And it's really frustrating because holy heck, <laughs> I really work hard to give her nice adventures enjoyable you know we go to the pool and the library and the park i take her to all kinds of different parks so that she has a variety not that it matters to her of kids to watch and i do occasionally get a thank you i had a really nice day but most of the time it's just i just get this contrary attitude that just makes me want to stuff her in the trunk you know, may I comment uh, yes, on please. that? I, uh, you know, with there's the difference. You're putting your finger on one of the differences I see between parents, a relationship with parents, and a relationship with your spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you're always the child in some senses, and parents frequently hold that late in life, and we as children do the same thing for our parents. You know, we don't want to really interfere with them when we see that it's necessary. They don't believe it's time. And there are lots of other things that go on in that interaction that make it different. Kate and I, in the, the very nature of our marriage has always, in fact, I learned very early, uh, preface this by saying, my parents had a great marriage. We were married 70 years, but they quibbled all the time. <laughs> my dad used to say, it's not a good day if we haven't had a fight. Now, I don't remember they're really fighting, but they did. They were just always a little bit nitpicking about things. Uh, parents, Sarah's parents, uh, Kate's parents never did that. When we married, something came up and I said something to Kate and it just broke her heart when I said it. That was something that I thought was just a natural thing that coming out of my family seemed innocent. And I learned right there very quickly our relationship needed to be different. I needed to respond differently to her or she was going to be hurt all the time. Therefore, the nature of our relationship has been that we are both conflict avoiders. Neither one of us wants conflict any, any with anybody. Mm -hmm. And we are both people who want to please others and each other. And I think those two things have worked in our favor as she's been uh, going through her Alzheimer's, that it is still there. Each of us is still playing out that scenario. Wow. Um, yeah, these, these dynamics are uh, not easy. And I understand. Thank you for sharing that, Richard. And Jennifer, I understand what you're saying. Um, but maybe it's time for you to shift into a, a different way of seeing that relationship, you know, um, because someday when your mom passes away and she's in the higher realms, don't think for one moment that she doesn't appreciate or have gratitude for the sacrifices that you make and for everything that you're doing with her, all the beautiful ways that you're trying to enrich her life right now. Um, I know she has it in her heart. And then, as I said, someday when she passes away from the higher realms, she, she will see a, a, a much bigger picture, but, from day to day, it's, you have to, see, that's the thing that's so difficult, especially with the, the dementia, all types of dementia, not just Alzheimer's. Um, the human brain is so, so complicated. And, and these stories of our loved ones, they're going to, to, to vary so greatly. You know, my experience with my dad is quite a bit different than maybe someone else had. You know, everyone has a very different experience. Richard's experience with Kate is different. Um, keep in mind that these chain, you're, you're seeing these things going on with her and you almost have to attribute, I'll, I don't want to give a percentage, but I'll just say a majority to that. Yes, she might remind you of the mom you had when you were in your teens and twenties, but remember that there's daily changes going on in her brain. Remember the organic changes that are happening. So unfortunately, there's going to be that layer. There might be sarcasm, quirkiness, you know, 
that may get better over time or lessen over time. I mean, my dad lost his voice for the last five years of his Alzheimer's journey. So that obviously was not a dynamic that we had. Um, and people would walk in all the time to, you know, his, um, his room at the nursing home and, you know, the, the, uh, the staff, the common question was, does he still know who you are? And it would frustrate me to no end because he did. And, um, just because he could no longer talk, um, you know, you, we saw it in his eyes. We saw that essence of Frank and it, it never left, you know, uh, up until his last day on earth. And, um, it's, it's tough as, as the, the family members, but you have to know though, that it's, a, we can't get a window into the human brain, but the disease is doing things that are going to perhaps make something worse. A part of your loved one's personality that was prevalent in earlier years might be lessened or it might be worse. Do you see what I'm saying, Jen? Yeah. And it's interesting because I see the the need to be a helpful, caring person from mom towards the other residents. But because she thinks I'm her best friend, I don't get affections. And I'm not necessarily looking for affections, but she won't, you know, hold my hand when we walk, you know, to keep her from being a fall risk, which I've discussed in the past. She won't walk elbow and elbow with me. You know, I give her a little, you know, I don't want to say a minor hug, it's just a light hug before I go every time. And that seems okay, but it's, it's not a full body hug that you would give your mom because she doesn't like that. So it's, it's really, it's almost like a, a brain game that I have to go through because there's the part where she says things that are, um, what's the right word? She'll say things in a coarse way, like, well, excuse me for living. And that's, that's the negative person that I knew growing up. And then I see her being helpful and, and kind to all the residents. And it's like, are you kidding me? And I just, that's just kind of how she was as I grew up. So I, I accept it, but oh, it's very difficult. So those things might be amplified now and they may get worse. And I understand what you're saying. At the heart of what you're saying is that you're hurt by it. Mm. You, you, want, you want the hand holding and I understand that. And you want the hugs and, and you want, when you walk in the room, her bedroom at, at her residence now, you want her to smile and say, oh, hi, I'm so glad you're here. I get that, what you're saying. So that's sort of a form of grief because your heart hurts. But understand too, there's a layer over your mom's essence. So it might be very hard. She might not truly see you. Like you said, she thinks she's your best friend and the daughter role maybe is on a shelf right now, but that's not her. That's what the disease is doing to her. But in her heart, she loves you so much, so much. And as I said, someday when she's in the higher realms and she, there's going to be so many blessings and you will feel that you may not feel it until she passes away. But Right now, I think, so you don't keep getting hurt, maybe just, just pivot into, okay, I'm your friend. And then, you know what? She's going to surprise you. And I think Richard's going to agree with me on this. You're going to find, after you put that, that, that desire maybe on, on this, just put it away a little bit. She's going to surprise you when you least expect it. She may reach out for your hand or say, let's walk arm in arm or or just, it could be the, the smallest gesture, but I have a feeling that that will happen. And I, and I know that's hard that, that what you're going through now, that's difficult. That's, that's tough stuff. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to keep that in mind because when I show up and like I said, in a, for a few weeks over the summer, she'd be in her room in a state of distress lately she's been out amongst the other residents doing whatever it is they do and when i show up i don't get an a, a oh hi i get well what are you doing here i mean it's friendly but it's like really <laughs> you know so i always say well i'm here to visit with you oh you know, and then she says a variety of different strange answers it's and i'm wondering if if i'm reacting 
like emotionally, like if it, it's like a barb hitting. And so she kind of gets that sense. And then I have to kind of pivot away from, you know, it would just be really nice if she just said, Oh, hi. So you don't have to tell me it's nice to see you or anything. <laughs> that would be wonderful. And then you get her and it's, you know, you're human. It's impossible not to show that emotion. Um, Richard, could you step in here? Because your experience is so different. Um, you know, you don't get those sorts of reactions from Kate. Has there ever been a time where maybe she was a little upset with you? And can you talk about how, or, or she didn't seem herself, how, how you pivoted away from that? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, I have tended to joke with her a lot. Uh, it's just part of my silly personality coming from my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah has, uh, Kate has never been one to do that. But she started uh, early on, she started joking with me, which I was encouraged about. But what, what happened was her joking uh, took on a sarcastic note and crept into being more serious. They, they didn't seem funny when she was joking with me. They seemed and so and this happened early in the morning, especially, and that's when she's groggiest, and, and I wake up alert, so those two things don't work well. Um, and I made a conscious effort to stop joking with her, uh, because I felt like I had led her into that by joking, and that she tried it, and it, it got into a, a very negative kind of interaction. So I cut out at that, and I work consciously very much the way Jennifer is working consciously now with her mother to, mm -hmm. to put on a happy face and to be soft and gentle and, and uh, particularly not abrupt with her in the morning. And uh, over time, I have found that that has worked out. And I mean, this made a change because I made a change, but it didn't happen overnight. It was a succession of, of a, really over a long term. Mm -hmm. You no longer have that. And, uh, I'm also thinking about the difference in the relationship again between a spouse and a parent. And I'm particularly as Jennifer, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, I believe I've heard your story from other women before whose mothers did not have dementia. Um, <laughs> that the mother daughter relationship has a lot of special qualities to it uh, in itself. And, and that's a complexity that the spousal arrangement doesn't have. Of course, a, two spouses could have a horrible relationship and, and exacerbate the problems with dementia. It just turns out ours has been a more um, a comforting, supportive, loving kind of relationship, which then has facilitated our getting along. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing I would add, and uh, Lisa, I think you probably feel this way, but we'll, we'll see. You know, a number of authorities suggest that that uh, getting angry or bitter are not things like that are not direct symptoms of dementia, but they're uh, a secondary act that occurs because they don't understand the intentions. And I find that with Kate now that, that there are times she misinterprets something I've said and she's she takes offense or she thinks I rushed her. I didn't mean to, but she felt it, and I. Re Boy, she's good about telling me, and I respond quickly to adjust and not push. And I think that has uh -huh. has helped me a lot in, in uh, improving the situation. That's a very good point, Richard. Um, yeah, uh, if we could get back to grief a little bit. Um, Richard, I have a question for you. Uh, do you let's I'd like to talk about anticipatory grief. Is that something that's a constant companion for you? Or are you able to just push that away? You talked about when you wake up early in the morning, it is there. It is fortunately it is not a constant companion. It uh not at all. However, it comes in waves. Mm -hmm. Uh it, it it sneaks up on me at times. And uh you know, I, I can't say that I can put my finger on it. I do think it's at least partially involved in new symptoms that Kate has. When something, you know, there's a new loss, something that I haven't seen before, it's a reminder of the direction in which we are moving and that I don't like that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then I, you know, I'm going to 
deal with that for a short time, but it is short lived. It's not something that lingers with me for a couple of days. Uh, it's, uh, it, but I, I do find I go through times when, when a day or so, I, you know, I'm really bothered and I think directly about anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. uh, I find myself thinking more about things I wouldn't have permitted myself to think. I think now about her death. Uh, just the other day, I was talking with someone and I was talking about, uh, for the first time, I think I've talked with some other people whose spouses have died um, shortly after the stage where Kate is right now. And I express my own feeling that as much as I would hate to lose her, I think I would feel good if she passed away before she had to spend five and a half years like her mother, uh, semi-conscious and, and unable to have much quality of life at all. So I, mm -hmm. I do think about death. It's, it's more present. Uh, I also was concerned about what would happen to me, what to her if something happened to me. Uh. We're both in good health but I have become uh, a little anxious about I, I mean, what would she do? She, she can't function without me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have my staff prepared to jump in for me and, and immediately before our son could get to us or our, our daughter, either one. Uh, but I have recently made arrangements at a continuing uh, care com res retirement community uh, mm -hmm. for us that would be a two year period, but I'm not sure Kate would be able to join me at that time and might not, might not be with me, but it enables me, I'm considered, a, having made a down payment, I'm considered a member of that community now, and I have all of their resources, which include a senior daycare, memory care unit, a skilled nursing, you know, the works, uh -huh. that I could take advantage of now if, I, if something happened to me. Well, that's great. So the element of planning, which folks talk about, but, but not often enough. And that's wonderful that you have thought that out, you know, through the long term, and it takes away some of the, the anxiety that you may feel the pressure may uh, to answer that question, what if, so you've taken that, instead of just sitting back and worrying about it, you've taken those steps. And that's great, Richard. Um, a question I have for you that Jennifer has brought up, um, it's talked about a lot in the media, is the male caregiver. Now, are you, how do you feel about, obviously you don't have a problem with sharing your feelings, but do you feel there's a stigma there? There's, there's even, you know, men in their, their teens, 20s, 30s, they, they, it's common now, uh, they just feel trapped with their emotions and that somehow it's not macho to express them. What are your thoughts and feelings around men expressing grief? I wish it could be otherwise. It would be my starting point, but I feel like there's so much history behind this. And uh, I, I do believe that we are changing. I believe men are learning a lot of things. I think that the way the world is changing with uh, more contact and uh, with women in work settings and in virtually every profession, I, I think the world is changing and men change with that. Um, but I think we're better off if we can express our feelings. Uh, and I don't know why I do. By the way, my father, as much as I admire him, he was not one to do that. <laughs> he, you know, he just never did it, but I, he was a man of his generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I don't know why I feel differently, but it's been a part of me. I, actually, I do think I'm a funny combination of my mother and my father, more, more my father, but I think I got a touch of my mother when it comes down to, uh, I don't know that I should say it this way, but a more feminine disposition in a variety of risks. I think I'm a more natural caregiver uh, than my father, almost my father, you know, he was so in love with my mother. He was a very, very loving caregiver to her and in to his significant other as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any instruction for, for other guys <laughs> to explain to them how they can be 
as I am, because I'm not certain I fully understand why I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I've been this way a long time. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why your um, journey with Kate has been, I don't want to say easier than other people, but that's the word that comes to mind. Well, you know, I also think, too, the fact that I've had gone through, I've been really involved with the caregiving. It wasn't just, you know, women often are the ones who carry that burden of caregiving. But I walked along with Kate in this with her parents, and then I handled it largely with my parents. I think all of that sensitized me to the whole situation of illnesses and the problems and, and trying to solve the problems. Uh, I am a planner, I think, by nature. I mentioned to uh, Jennifer earlier that I have a little touch of OCD. And uh, <laughs> so I, I like to know about things in the future. I've always, by the way, part of my own career was involved in market research and, I, and in tourism, particularly. I know that women are the ones largely who are the focus of advertising in tourism because women are the ones who largely plan vacations. My wife's never planned <laughs> anything related to a vacation at all. And we've had spectacular trips, but every one we've had, I've planned. So, you know, I don't know how I explained entirely <laughs> why I'm what I am, but I do think it has been fortuitous in terms of the responsibilities that I presently have and makes it easier for me to do what I need to do. Uh -huh. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Richard. Um, Jennifer, do you want to touch on any other points about grief that we haven't covered yet? Well, as I've mentioned, I go see mom once a week after my rotary meeting on Mondays. It's, it, it's what works. And I'm like Richard, I'm a planner and I don't, I don't shift my plans easily which sometimes is not good. I mean, I'm pretty flexible, but you know, when you look at your week and it's structured in a certain way, it's, it's not easy to just say, well, let me just juggle all this around. And so I can see mom on a different day that didn't start out frustrating for me. As I mentioned, you know, the, the visit we had a couple weeks ago did not go well. And I think a lot of it was because my day didn't start out great. And I probably carried more of that with me than I should have. But the other day I was just thinking, I'm like, what in the heck am I going to do with Monday afternoons when she's gone? And it, you know, it, there's days when I think, oh, I'm so done with this. I'm, you know, it's so exhausting. I'm always trying to be happy and give her joy. And even though she's poking every button that I've got and repeating herself in this, you know, the same word in the same place and, ugh, you know, and then I think, okay, what am I going to do with myself on Monday afternoons? And it was really kind of, an interesting maybe thought experiment because I thought that's going to be really strange as uh -huh. much as I don't particularly enjoy visits. It's, I don't, I don't dislike them. They're just, it's very hard to explain. I, I, they're, they're, they're a job. I take her out to give her a change of scenery, which is good for her you know, and I try to give her joy because that's about all I can do. I mean, she can't participate in the activities. She doesn't communicate, you know, much anymore. Her, her book, you know, her, her language processing is, is almost as bad now as her visual processing. So it's, it's very, it's almost like taking a, a toddler to the park that the one that can't play. And we just sit there and I'm, I'm having to find ways to find enjoyment. Like the other day, it was really nice. You know, it's fall, so it's, it's beautiful. And, you know, the sun was warm, the breeze was cool. And she's watching the kids. And after a little while, I'm done watching the kids go on the slide. So I just close my eyes and put my head back on the bench and listen to the birds and listen to the kids squeal and play and stuff and that helped a lot because if i'm just sitting there watching the kids like she's doing my brain is going round and round and round and round about the 500 things i should be doing uh -huh. i really hate that part <laughs> so that's great that you uh, you just sat back and let nature 
uh, surround you and enjoy the sights and the sounds of Mother Nature. That's wonderful. Getting to the point, too, where I, I just admit to myself more and to people around me, it's like, I am useless when I get home from dealing with my mom. Even if it's an hour and a half, two hours, my brain is so tired. It's, it's interesting because I generally want a light snack at about four o'clock, which is about the time I start leaving her. And I don't bring, you know, it's like I've already bring food with me to the meeting. So I'm not packing a giant picnic basket full of food. So I get home and I'm hungry and I'm tired. And I always think, well, I'll respond to these emails or I'll, you know, I'll do it. Never happens. I come home, read news articles, read a book, just lay on the, you know, watch the TV show or something, just anything. My brain is just done. Mm -hmm. And I'm just having to admit that I'm not any good on Monday evenings. Dementia journey is not easy, but um, maybe we'll close with self-care. Talk a little bit about that because, you know, as we're um, experiencing this journey with our loved one with dementia and grieving along the way, you know, it's important that we, we take care of ourselves. Um, Richard, would you like to share what, what you do for yourself regarding self-care? Well, I'd be uh, happy to, and I also, I'm going to have to leave uh, in a few minutes, so I'm, I will summarize quickly, but I do a lot of things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have read for a long time, and I read, I, I exercise, and I read. I've been going to the Y for many years. I keep going. I no longer go in the morning because I feel I can't leave her. So I have, that's why I have a sitter three afternoons a week that enables me to go to the Y for that. In addition, I walk and I walked in the neighborhood until about a little over a year ago. And then I just felt I couldn't leave Kate in the morning. So mm -hmm. I literally walk within the house for 40 minutes every morning, uh, listening to my audio books. So I listen to audio. So the audio books and the exercise help me. In addition, uh, music, uh, we don't have time to tell you everything, but we have binged on music. I play music all the time and it goes from the time, well, just after I listen to NPR in the, in the mm -hmm. morning, uh, then I turn on music and it goes, we even go to bed with music playing at night. Okay, mm -hmm. In the car going and coming. Uh, I, I selected, originally I did this because of the panic attacks that, and anxiety attacks that Kate would have. I played, started off with a Brahms violin concerto, the second movement of that, and added Mildenson and Tchaikovsky, and then now I've just got tons of stuff that I play all the time. So music has been really therapeutic for me. I continue to be involved. I've been a very active community volunteer, both with our health foundation on, on whose board I served for nine years and chaired it for two years. Uh, I've been uh, inactive with United Way since 1984 and I'm active with them right now. So I meet with them. Uh, I serve on two different United Way committees. Mm -hmm. uh, I still, I don't do much. I gave up. I used to teach a class at church. I gave that up uh, two years ago uh, because I needed more time with Kate and she can't, it's hard for her to get up in the morning. Uh, but I maintain contact with people. We get out, we eat. I chose eight years ago for us to eat out for every meal. And we have eaten out, uh, you know, about 6,000 times in those, that time wow. period. Uh, and that has enabled us. The food means essentially nothing. That's a frill. It's the social contact that's been critical for us. Uh, it has kept us from being isolated. It's worked for Kate and it's worked for me. For Kate, it involves short-term interactions that she can handle, and they're usually one-on-one -on -one with a server or somebody, some friend we see, and we always see friends. They're virtually every time we go out, we'll bump into somebody from the community that we know from either work, our professions, or from church, or from some voluntary organization. And those kind of interactions are great for her because she knows how to say, greet somebody, oh, it's good to see you, even if she doesn't know who they are, she's able to carry that off beautifully even now. So I've got a ton of stuff and, and uh, I've got uh, people, we, you know, we invite, invite people out. We, we've got friends in three different cities around here that we take day trips to to visit uh, fairly frequently. Some overnight trips still. Overnight's the only kind of travel we do now. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of things that keep me going. I like to be busy and it has helped me tremendously. 
wow, thank you for sharing all of that. What wonderful examples. And I think, Jennifer, I know you'll agree. I think Richard's given an, our listeners um, some new ideas as well. You know, um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, you know, wonderful. I didn't, by the way, mention the blog, of course, and Twitter. <laughs> which Excellent. Is a thing. Writing, yes. What's the, what's the web address of your blog, Richard? It's HTTP, and then the, I never remember whether it's colon, forward slash, forward slash, but it's living with Alzheimer's. The key is it's not a www.livingwithalzheimers.com, but it is just the HTTP and then livingwithalzheimers.com. Okay, that, okay. I'll make sure that's, that's linked on the show notes. Okay, I'll send you the link. Do Thank you. you. Share, do you update it? Weekly or daily, Richard? How often are you writing on your blog? Oh, that's a funny thing. I I try. I I write almost daily. Sometimes more often than daily. Wonderful. I, I average more than one a day. Um, and that what's funny about that is I hate to write. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't like it at all. But I have felt uh, having started this. It's funny. I feel a commitment, and I my unstated goal is to have something by nine o'clock each morning. And I find that more recently that is harder for me to achieve. And I'm about to write a post, I think for tomorrow saying I, a real success was scored yesterday when I didn't write one at all. And I didn't feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> so That's part of my OCD. Oh, uh, well, that's wonderful. Gosh, thank you. Well, it, I enjoyed being a guest today. Thank you for this opportunity, Jennifer. Thank you, Richard. It was great to spend time with you both. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us at the last minute today.